You see, Satan doesn't care what the Muslims think. He doesn't care what the Buddhists think. He cares what God thinks. And he's opposed to God and the things of God and the people of God, and he always has been. He hates Israel. He hates the church. He hates the cause of Christ. He hates the gospel message. And he will do everything he can to either oppose it or counterfeit it one way or another. Truth is fallen in the street. There is no peace. Why? Verse 16. And he saw that there was no man, and he wondered that there was no intercessor, nobody to pray, nobody to plead. Therefore, his arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness sustained him, and he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance, and he went forth clad with zeal as his cloak. Now, the Apostle Paul takes that right out of the Old Testament into his epistles when he describes the armor of Christian warfare. Uh, every New Testament writer assumes the reader understands the Old Testament roots of what they're talking about. The one ultimately that comes armed in the righteousness and the power of God is none other than the Son of God. You say, how do you know that? Look at verse 20. And the Redeemer shall come from Zion and shall turn the transgression of Jacob away. Why, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, my words that I have put in your mouth, they will not depart out of your mouth or the mouth of your seed or your seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth. There is an answer coming, Isaiah says. I say him in the future. It's the Redeemer himself. He is the one, the Goel of Israel. He is the one that will fulfill these promises. Chapter 60, verse 1, Arise, shine. Why? For thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. In verse 3, the Gentiles will come to your light. The Goim will come to the truth of God through the message of the Redeemer of God himself, who is none other than the El Gibor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Shar Shalom. How do we know it's Jesus? Go to chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to do what? Preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prison to them that are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus dares to stand in the synagogue of Nazareth in his hometown in Luke the fourth chapter and read that passage and declare to them, Today this is fulfilled in your ears. I'm the one who is the Messiah. I am the Mashiach, the anointed one. It's all of, everybody wants to talk today about, I'm getting the anointed, I'm getting the anointing, etc. You better get Jesus. He's the one who's anointed. I'm the one that's anointed, he said. I'm the one that's been sent to proclaim the year of Jubilee, to set the captives free, to cancel the debts, to unbind the burdens. But then notice the verse goes on to say, and the day of the vengeance of our God. He did not read that back in the synagogue in Nazareth. Why? Because in His first coming, He has come to die for our sins. He has come to make peace with God, to atone for our sins. The sinless Son of God would enter into the human race. He would go to the cross, die not as a martyr, not as a victim, but He would die as a Savior in our place, the Lamb of God who bears our sins, who sheds His blood on our behalf and rises triumphantly. It is in the second coming that He comes to proclaim the day of vengeance that shall come in the future. Therefore, He declares in chapter 62, verse 1, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. I will not shut up. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Until what? Until the right righteousness goes forth as brightness and salvation like the lamp that burns. And the Gentiles will see your righteousness and all the kings will see your glory and you will be called by a new name. I'll never give up on Jerusalem, he says, until they finally come to a relationship with me and the glory of God shines in her streets and the Gentiles are attracted to the holiness and the glory and the power of God himself through her message. And I will give her a new name in verse 4. No more will she be called forsaken or desolate, but her new name will be Hephzibah, uh, the delight of the Lord, and Beulah land, married 
to the Lord himself. Jesus comes as the bridegroom, seeking the bride, calls us unto himself, and refers to the believer as the bride of Christ. He says, I'm not going to give up until I have found the bride, until I have called her unto myself. I'm not going to give up on that little lost lamb until I bring that lamb into the fold, as we heard in the previous hour. God is in the process of extending grace. God is the one that can bring peace. But here's the shock. Peace will come only after judgment. Look at chapter 63. Who is this that comes from Edom? Uh, dyed garments from Bozerah near Petra. That is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. Uh, that I speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why are you red in your apparel? Your garments like one that treads in the wine fat. For I have trodden the winepress alone. He goes on to say in verse 4, The day of vengeance is in my heart. In the second coming, Christ comes in judgment on an unbelieving world. He comes trampling the grapes of wrath. Uh, those blood-splattered images of the coming of Christ in the book of Revelation, who rides out of heaven on a white horse in a garment dipped in blood. It's not his blood. It's the blood of the enemy. He's trampling over the enemy, crushing resistance finally. You say, well, that sounds awfully judgmental. Every time there's a horrible injustice that occurs in society, something inside of us says, you can't let this happen. It's got to be dealt with. Uh, the kid that went wild in the movie theater in Colorado and shot everybody, you can't let him get away with this. Deal with this. That's an injustice that was done. And justice cries out for what? Judgment. We are in a society that is so spiritually and morally bankrupt and upside down when you have a culture in which there are no absolute values. The only value left is tolerance. Tolerate everything and anything. Even injustice? No, there's some things that are so bad, something in human nature says, no, you've got to deal with that. God says, I'm not going to let the world get away with sin forever. I'm not going to let them get away with rebellion forever. I'm not going to let them get away with war forever. Oh, I'll bring peace. I'll bring it to the person of Christ. And in the first coming, He comes to offer you peace by faith in His atonement for you on the cross. But in the second coming, He comes to bring judgment. And that's what will bring peace. The day of vengeance, when He appears in the book of Revelation and squashes the army of the Antichrist, speaks the word and they're gone. He doesn't come with guns and tanks and bombs. He who spoke the world into existence simply speaks, and the army of the Antichrist is slain. The beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. Satan is bound in the abyss. Now, finally, justice is done. The prince of peace has come. Look at chapter 64, verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down. You ever thought that? Oh, God! Do something. Don't let them get away with this. When are you going to come down and change this old world? And the prophet Isaiah said, trust me, he's coming. And when he comes, he will come with power. He will come with authority. He will come with justice, but he will also come with mercy. Chapter 65, verse 1, I am sought of those that did not ask for me. I am found of those that did not seek me. Behold, those that did not call on my name. The Gentiles will come to faith. I will call them into the family of God. They will no longer be the goyim, but the ami, the people of God. And he builds crescendo after crescendo uh, in this passage. And when you come to the 66th chapter, you have that incredible verse that takes you into the eschatological future. And he says in chapter 66, verse 8, who has heard of such a thing, who has seen such things, shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, shall a nation be born at once? But as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. He looks down to the corridor of time, to a time when Israel, scattered throughout the nations, would return to the land of Israel, that the nation would be born in one day. That did not happen in Joshua's conquest. That did not happen when they returned from the Babylonian captivity. That only happened in May of 1948, when the nation of Israel in one day was born at once as a nation by a declaration of independence. Isaiah saw it 
in advance. And he goes on to say, I'll call you from the east and the north and the west and the south. I'll gather them again into my glorious land. Why am I going to do that? What are you trying to accomplish? The end of verse 19, I will declare my glory among the Gentiles. Verse 20, and they will bring your brethren as an offering unto the Lord out of all the nations unto the holy mountain of Jerusalem. And he goes on to proclaim a time of the millennial kingdom, of the millennial blessing. And then he looks even beyond that in verse 22, to the new heavens and to the new earth. And the whole book in these closing chapters builds one wave after another after another. If you read it without stopping, you're caught up in this crescendo. Hinene! Here I am. Send me. The end of the book. Hinene! Here I am, God says. I will come. Behold your God, the Redeemer, the El Gibor, the Emmanuel, the God with us, the Shar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. And then the book of Isaiah ends with probably the most shocking, the most difficult verse in all of the Bible. So difficult, so tough, you may have never heard a sermon on it. Look at that last verse of chapter 66. He looks down into the future and says, all the believers will come and worship me. And they'll go forth and they'll look on the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. And their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorring to all flesh. He reminds you that there are two choices, God's way, man's way. There are two destinies, heaven and hell. There are those that will not be in heaven, lost for all eternity. They say, man, I don't want that to be me. What do I have to do to get in? There's nothing you can do. You can't get in. You can't work your way. You can't buy your way. You can't suffer your way. There are people throughout the world that try to beat themselves bloody thinking that'll make God happy. No, it won't. People in the Old Testament world, Canaanite pagans did that. And Elijah the prophet told them, you're wasting your time. You can't work your way by good works. Isaiah himself said, watch, your good works are like filthy rags. They're not enough. You say, well, if the best that I can do is not enough, what's good enough? The suffering servant who goes to the cross, who bears your sin, who dies in your place. If the Lamb of God and His substitution is not enough, if the violent death of the sinless Son of God is not enough to pay for your sins, nothing is. If He is not the Savior, there is no Savior. If that is not grace, there is no grace. If that is not salvation, there is no salvation. But hallelujah, the message of the prophet Isaiah is, El Gabor is coming, the mighty God. Judah, open your heart and see him. He will come to your rescue. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He'll suffer like a suffering servant. He'll rise like a triumphant king. He'll trample the enemy into submission, and he will reign and rule as king. And every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then you'll have world peace. Several people have appealed to you already. And if you've come to this conference and you don't know that Savior, I want to urge you, as Dr. Hawking comes to close the conference, one last opportunity. You open your heart and life to make peace. What does the Bible say? Kiss the Son, lest He come in judgment. You'll face Him one day either as your Savior or as your judge. But Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world. I came that the world might be what? Saved. 